You're listening to the Write Project Podcast and Radio Program, a show about writing and modern Newfoundland author culture. This program is produced and recorded at CHMR-FM 93.5 FM in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and is aired on other great stations in the province and elsewhere in the country. It can also be heard online at www.chmr.ca. I'm your host, Matthew LeDrew. Welcome to a very special episode of the Write Project Podcast. Today, we've got a host of authors on to answer one of the most frequent questions that's asked of any author. We're asking them, How do you balance making demands of the reader with taking care of the reader? And today to answer, we have on J.E. Solo. She recently just put out her novel, Freak. Um, J.E. Solo, how do you balance making demands of the reader with taking care of the reader? Which I'm only realizing after taking Tracy Waddleton's class, and I I think you know her, uh, is basically Uh asking show, don't tell kind of thing. Like, making demands of the reader is showing them things and just expecting them to put two and two together. And taking care of them would be telling them, no, no, two plus two is four. Uh, let me see... I might have fudged up the question there by putting no, my own No, I think I it. get it. I, I'm just not. Um, just trying to think about how I reconcile. You know, I really try to make things so. I, I do try to show, not tell. And again, this is a, a talk about theater as well. Theater is very much the same. That's really show, not tell. Um, it's definitely more effective. I want the reader to, certainly in the case of my most recent book, kind of be the character, be in the character, feel the character. Um, So I guess I'm uh, going for a a sympathy with the reader, um, which they may or may not have because, um, you know, people either will or won't relate to where I'm coming from, where the character is coming from in, the, in that case. Um, I don't think I'm doing a great job of answering this question. You're doing fine. Um, <laughs> um, I guess I just try to do my best to make it as beautiful as I possibly can for the reader while never compromising what I'm trying to do. My big thing that I'm learning and it's undoing all that stuff I was talking about, about proposals and business plans is to never be boring. Yeah. And, uh, this is, this is, um, you know, what I, what I challenge myself with. I think I'm still undoing it a little bit, um, to always be, to not telegraph, to not condescend, to not spoon feed, um, To not, yeah, so to leave lots for the reader to put together while maintaining a story, you know. That's awesome. No, that makes perfect sense to me. And and freak is anything but boring. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Chelsea B., author of London Calling and Christmas Mornings. This is such a weird one. Answer it however you want or not at all. How do you balance making demands of the reader uh, with taking care of the reader? And I kind of understand because, like, I do make certain demands of the reader as I grew. Like, the yeah. difference between the Coral Beach Case Falls series, where I basically held the reader's hand, and, like, at the end of everything, at the end of every mystery the three main characters would chat about the mystery and talk about what they learned and who did it and why just for just in case someone didn't get it. Right. Like, they exist to talk about it just in case someone didn't get it. In the Xander Drew series, I just be like, figure it out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, there's... I mean, in, in romance, there's less of a demand for, you know... Like, in, in fantasy, you know, you demand that they understand that the wizard did it, the magic exists... This is it. But I think in... Um, I, I ask that in contemporary, the readers kind of understand that, like, this is reality as the character sees it. Even if you don't agree or you don't see that, you know, reality as true, you it's real for them, which makes it real. Their okay. perception is real. 
and as well as from taking care of the reader uh, if you're assume if you if I want them to assume that the character is right in their and the expert of their own experience then if it's an unreliable narrator that makes that really difficult so yeah. I normally don't have those as much as I love them yeah I find it was really hard sometimes the arguments that I get not that I really argue with people but the things that people say that I take issue with the most personally but I'll never argue or anything like that online mm -hmm. is when someone says oh no you said this in book one I'm like no the villain said it why did you believe them yeah like yeah if the narrator says it it's true and it's 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 gospel kind of thing if a character says it they could be lying or wrong yeah you have to assume that what the villain says is either it could be wrong or it you know could be when I was trying to read Harry Potter to my niece and she was highly offended that um, Mr. Dursley called the witch's robes stupid because it's mean to call someone's outfit stupid and she didn't want to hear about it. And I was like, but he's the bad guy. And she was like, but he should be nicer. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everyone should agree with me. Thank you very much. Next up, we have the author of Alligator and February, Lisa Moore. Uh, Lisa Moore, how do you balance making demands on the reader, in your fiction this is, uh, with taking care of the reader? Making demands on the reader with taking... Okay, how do I manage to manage? <laughs> how do I manage taking care of the reader and demanding from the reader? Yeah, that balance, well, I guess, yeah. I guess the thing is that when I'm writing a story, I often have some formal concern th that I've set up for myself as a problem. So, for instance, there's a story I, I wrote called Melody. And in that story, I, I, had, I had made up my mind that turning a page 20 years would have passed. And I had done this because I'd read um, To the Lighthouse where by Virginia Woolf where you turn a page and I don't know what I, I can't remember exactly how many years had passed but enough that the, the main character had died and there is no warning that this would happen and I thought that is a very interesting narrative um you know problem to solve because we do sometimes experience time that way time you know can flick by decades sometimes in what seems like the blink of an eye. So I was interested in exploring what that would feel like and how it would form the characters and shape them. But I also didn't want to lose the reader. I didn't want the reader to go, what? What happened? So um, again, I think if the characters are um, flesh and blood real and if they have conflicts that, uh, you know, suit the characters in that the reader can truly believe this would actually happen to that character because of that character's particularly particular life circumstances, then I think they'll follow you anywhere. Okay. That's, thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have BC Labeled, the Canadian independent author of the 10th Lunan Regiment series, a military sci-fi saga. He also writes an immersive dark fantasy series. His current titles include To Drown in Sand, Juris Lunance, To Drown in Ash, The Dog, Bone, and Upon a Wake of Flame. Um, BC Labeled, uh, how do you balance making demands on the reader uh, and their what you expect of them with also taking care of the reader? Yeah, so huge problem. Uh, <laughs> I, I tend not to bother. Um, I, I, there are rules, right? So you've got to have a solid plot. You've got to have character character consistency. You can't Game of Thrones it. You, yeah. You can't. You can't. Um, like without without being too vicious. Um, uh, no, be vicious. Well, like the Game of Thrones novels. Uh, I I've read every one of them. Okay, the big Game of Thrones and, novels, which I always like interject in, will never be finished. Well, okay, so we're going to do this then. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I agree with you, because he's he's overwritten himself. Yeah. But the problem is, 
I, and I can't remember which book it was. It was, it was the one where I can't remember which which number novel it is. But it was the one where. Um, Are you saying the they author- all blend together? No, Almost like quite. they're not badly quite. written. No. no, 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 no. Uh, no, I won't give you that. I, I humbly disagree with you, sir, on that one. Um, I think that it, it would have made an awesome trilogy, and he should have stopped at book four at the most. Yeah, fair. Um, okay. Uh, and he could have packed and worked everything in, and it would have been one of the most amazing series of books ever written. And I am no one to criticize George R. R. Martin. I just simply am not. The man is a best-selling novelist. He's, he's done it all. Uh, he, he hit the dream. He, he, you know, his book was sitting, squandering for in the seventies. I remember picking up the early copies and going, look at the cover and being like, oh, geez, I'll never read this. Um, and and bam, he hits the jackpot and HBO and everything. There's two games of throning it. One of them is what he did with the books, and it's the it's the scene when the Ironbound are unleashed, and there's this new vicious character. It's the uncle, and he's taking over the oceans. And I'm like, hang on, I'm seven books in. You just threw me a new super character. What the hell happened to Sam Tarly, and why did you tell me things were going to change at the end of that book? And by the end of the very last book that he wrote, which is 1,000 pages long, yeah, and nothing really happens until the end when Jon Snow gets stabbed. I'll, I'll throw that out there. Spoiler warning after the, after the, after the fact. Um, I, I realized he doesn't... He, there's too too many ants in the ant farm. He can't track all these anymore. So what he just did was kill a character at the end because he was going to pull us in. He's written two 500-page books since the since Dance of Dragons, I think it is. Or, yeah, it's, it's the very last book. There are preludes. So he hasn't wrapped this up. He, he's written and, himself into a corner he doesn't know how to get away from. And, and I don't... And I feel terrible saying that because... I would, it could happen to me. I could, I could end up in the same boat where I'm like, I don't know what to do with this anymore. It's too big. It went too big. Um, and I don't know what to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. That could happen. It can happen to anybody. I get that. Um, so that's one version of games, of game of throwing it. The other one is what HBO did, which is like, I, I don't even want to get into that because I start to sob like a child. Um, but those are the two things I make myself avoid as I'm writing. I, I won't let myself go I there. make myself avoid Game of Thrones Season 8 as well, whether I'm writing um, or not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I'm plotting things out, if it looks like it's going in that direction, it's just full stop. I'm just like, these two things I will not allow to happen. My ambition or my ego is not going to let myself soil all the work that I put into characters and story for that purpose. So, um, I guess that's a long, convoluted answer to your question, but that's that, that's where I come from. See, you know when I got sick of Game of Thrones? Season 3, and I read the books all the way through around that same point, so I, I kind of read ahead of the series. So I read it all, and I kind of... I don't know. I'm. Ba- I'm. It sounds like we have some things different. Like I'm a slave to structure. My early stuff, I I never did structure. Like I never structured it beforehand. But afterwards, I was like, you know what? When I structure stuff, my first draft reads like a fourth draft. Like it just it just helps. Sure. It, it gets out some of the crazy, and I can still sure. play around. I always say that like start with the structure. But if your writing takes you a different direction then redo the structure. Don't slavishly go to it. But, like... Yeah, do, but like yeah, don't, I, um, don't chain yourself to the plan. Oh, God, no. Don't chain yourself to the plan. That's a horrible idea. Um, but, like, I, I watched the first three seasons, and I read all the books, and I kind of just had this mental map, because if you've written a lot, then I find that movies and books, like, you start to see, like, oh, you see the setups... And then you see the reminds, so you can guess the payoff. Like, most writers can guess the end of murder mysteries pretty early on, and stuff like that. So, I was kind of playing with it in my head, and I'm like, there is, he's reached a point, like a critical mass, where there's literally no way for him to resolve all the plot threads he's created in a um, satisfying way. Like, he can't, he's created too many plot threads and too many characters, he can't resolve it all. 
and, and it's going to go bad. So that was my experience reading reading the novels, um, and it was. I, I remain optimistic. I, I, it's almost like what's happening to Star Wars now. I, but I think that I think that George R. R. Martin, if he sits down and really, really works, uh, the 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 end of the series of novels um, can still pay off in a way that. We'll forgive him for everything else. I, 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 and I'm not an optimistic person, but I, I believe this because this is the brain that created this world. And what carried me through it was my absolute passion for the characters that he built. That's fair. So, like, for example, Aria is one of the most... Uh, that is one character that I have cared about the most ever in my life amongst anything I've ever read. And I don't know why. I have no idea why. Um, but I will follow that series of novels to the bitter end to find out what happens with Aria because that character resonated with me so deeply. Um, there are other characters that I, I really enjoyed and loved, but nothing, nothing hooked me like Aria. And the brain that can create that character, I hold out some faith that, that um, he can throw the switch back and be like, okay, there's a lot of stuff that i got to shave off, but... I gotta, I gotta give everybody this thing, um, and and interesting of note, they did it with HBO, but they just didn't do it with a whole bunch of other characters that were really important. And tragically, we didn't want to see what happened happen. Yeah, um, yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm. To be fair, I'm the wrong one to ask about this kind of thing. My, my thing is like. To me, George R. R. Martin's greatest accomplishment, greatest gift to literature, is the fact that now J.R.L. Tolkien isn't the worst fantasy novel writer of all time. Oh, yeah, I've heard you talk about this before. <laughs> it must kill you. <laughs> it does. In a matter of respect for my host, yeah. I will, I will uh, humbly remain seated. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? Part of it's just trolling. I I, I find I, I I liked it. I like the movies. I like I love the Hobbit. I I my joke that's not really a joke with uh, the the Holy Trilogy is it could have used an edit. Like it could have been two books. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I I agree with you there. Um, having said that, the at the age I was when I read when I read The Lord of the Rings, because I had a, a nerd buddy who's like, you cannot breathe oxygen until you've read these books. Um, Tolkien, and I will always adore him for this, literally took my brain and unpeeled it like an onion. That's he fair. taught me He taught me how to, and so did Lovecraft. They taught me how to use language. They taught me how to, how to read. They taught me the value of a, of, of a good writer. Um, and I mean, if you've got an Oxford man of letters, you're going to get a book that is going to be flowery um, and is, is going to carry you along this dance uh, that that is his own personal journey uh, and whimsy. And so I, I was all in. And I, I'll never change my mind about that part. That's fair. Um, looking at Martin... I mean, the one thing that I see as a substantial difference between HBO and and the books is HBO is edited. Yeah, M Martin. I, it feels like, and I'm probably wrong. Um, Martin was given carte blanche and unlimited word count, and just like, hey, we've hit gold. Keep writing because you know nothing was very big in fantasy that moved. Um, like maybe series of fortune advance or something along those lines. Nothing was moving in terms of fantasy books off the shelf other than Warhammer uh, fiction, which is a whole other thing. Um, uh, that's more of a subgenre, but uh, nothing was moving. So when you tap a gold vein and you're, you know, publishing a guy like Martin, you'd be like, I'm not taking any words. Just, just go like, give us everything you've got. And we need the big, you know, monolithic uh, hard covers on the shelves, and Martin was like, "Yeah, I can do that." So, I, you know, this is me paraphrasing, but uh, I believe that's what happened. And so, you know, 
because every time he introduced, like, I'll never forget Sam Tarley coming to the Citadel, bringing the stuff to the big boss at the Citadel, and he says, okay, I made it, this is it. And the guy's like, oh, so you've come. Now we have to do the thing. And then the thing never happens. And it's like, wow, you you can't, you, what? Yeah. What's your angle? Where are you coming from? And and it's it's I, I think it's kind of obvious, but I I, I remain hopeful because um, because of my area fixation. I, I, I just I have to see how all of this comes together. If he finishes it, if he doesn't finish it, then everything remains a big question mark. And I will tell people who ask me um, stop after the third book if you're really nuts about it. Stop after the fourth. Yeah, I um I also find like his shock death thing became a bit overblown because like really like he, he got a lot of buzz the tv show got a little bu- a lot of buzz early on for like holy junk you don't know who's going to die ever but really right. after joffrey there were no shocking deaths like everyone who mattered was pretty safe after joffrey and i think that's when the marketing started to have its gravity and and pull things towards a certain direction, right? So it's like, okay, we're going to flick off as many fleas uh, in the first little while to keep everybody uncertain, and then we're going to make it safe because we have to go for X number of seasons and we got to keep the fan base alive. Yeah. Uh, and then every once in a while they throw a guy into the blender, which, you know, that, that happened. Um, good or bad, I don't know. Because I was with the show until halfway through the last season. Because um, I didn't think they were going to do what they did. But they did, so okay, whatever. Um, it's I still learned a lot from it about what not to do. Yeah. The last, the last half of the season of Game of Thrones, the last season of Game of Thrones, taught me don't ever do this to people because it's an awful thing to do. <clears throat> and so you come away with a lot of lessons about writing on that, I think. Um but um, but yeah, it it, it it was hard to watch. It was hard to watch, for sure. Absolutely. I agree. Thank you very much. Next on the line, we have Amanda Labonte, author of the Call of the Sea and Supernatural Causes series. Uh, Amanda Labonte, how do you balance making demands on the reader with taking care of the reader? I mean, I don't know that I do. Um, I think I, I did. I used to take drama classes when I was younger, um, and one of the things I had a really good drama teacher in grade ten. He was actually um, actually he was a terrible drama teacher. He was an awesome person and an awesome actor. He was uh, filling in because our teacher was on sabbatical okay. and. Uh, so he was very clear he was only doing this job for a year because he needed money. Um, but otherwise, he was actually a professional actor who'd been in um, some actually, like, professional things, like, that we'd seen on TV. So it was kind of cool to have him as a as a teacher. And he always would tell us to never um, underestimate our audience. So even though, like, I never actually went into any sort of acting, um, one of the things, like, that I that stuck with me and I transfer over to writing is that I try to do. Um, and I think everybody tries to do this, but if, if I'm, if I was going to try and do anything is to assume your reader can like, and the, you assume your reader can keep up and yeah. don't assume you have to tell them absolutely everything. Um, have you ever if had you a, show them, sorry, uh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, if you, if you show them that a character is untrustworthy, you don't have to say it. Yeah. Um, cause your reader will pick that up. Like if, you know, you don't have to, if, if Susie walks into a Walmart and steals a pack of gum, you don't have to then go and say, well, Susie's not a trustworthy individual. Um, like the reader will make those leaps and, and you can even, that's, that's a really obvious one, but like you can be, be more subtle. Like, um, and so, and usually I, I, I rely on an editor to tell me if that's working. Like if an editor comes back and says, am I supposed to trust this character? And I'm like, yeah, that's a good guy. And they're like, well, maybe you might want to fix it. Like that's kind of the, the advice I look for because um, generally I, I want to present things in such a way that if I show something that, that the reader will kind of intuit it. Likewise, if somebody isn't 
a hundred percent trustworthy. I don't want that to like, um, I, I at least want there to be breadcrumbs for the reader to look back and say, Oh yeah, I can see that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Have you ever met someone or be friends with someone that couldn't intuit things like that? L- like, like that just <laughs> like, like would just ask like, why were they all mad at her for stealing the gum or whatever like that? You know what I mean? Like yeah. that, that had to have the characters look at the camera and go, that means she's untrustworthy. I, I mean, I assume they're not reading a lot. That's Is that terrible to say? Yeah, that's that's. Yeah. Right. Well, just because if you re- if you're a reader, if you're somebody who reads a lot, yeah, um, of anything like comic books, like any like children's books, like anything, like if you read a lot of of reading material, I feel like you kind of even the news, like you will kind of get that kind of vibe from from what people show you maybe not the news the news is more like the, the news does like i'm not de- denigrating the news but just by the yeah. nature of what it is good news will just be like here is what this means just in case well i mean if you were but like if you read the news then like and you just read like an article on if you're reading an objective news, sorry, an objective news article and not like someone's opinion, yep. and you just read everything Donald Trump did leading up to the last election, and you couldn't intuit certain things about his character just from like a plain black and white read of, well, he did this, followed by this, followed by this, and he said this, this, and this. That's Even fair. somebody not saying like, you know, I think, I think he was maybe not acting in an ethical manner here, or maybe he was stirring up a crowd here like even with someone not making those sorts of statements i think like showing action should for most people kind of indicate but i mean that's the thing like i'm i'm in t- i'm assuming that the reader is smart enough to pick up on things and if they're not i'm assuming that um they're probably not my audience that's fair that's fair and i, and I don't mean my audience has to be like like, I'm not, like, a crazy, super smart person. I just mean, like, that I think that the type of, like, I think it's more annoying to an avid reader to pick up something and feel like somebody is over-explaining something to them than it is for somebody who doesn't really want to pick up a book and find that, like, oh, they can't follow along to it. Like, I just, I, I, I don't want to offend the reader. I feel like the worst for me, like, in this um, avenue... Like, in this train of thought. And I deal with this a lot in my writing classes. It's something that I always pick up and go, no, 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 this needs to be fixed. Is when the character's actions make you intuit one thing about them. and But then the writer chooses to tell you what to think of them, and it's the mm-hmm. opposite. And that's where your editor should really save you. Yeah, like it's one thing yeah. to show, Cause, it's cause one thing to tell, that. it's one thing to show and tell opposites. And and that's because I write out of order, so sometimes I really super rely on an editor to tell, because sometimes a character evolves as I write, Yeah. and I, I super rely on an editor to say, like, the voice, like their voice changed here, like that, I don't think they talk like that, or you know, this isn't consistent with how they met, or, you know, I really rely on them to kind of point out that my cues don't match anymore or beta reader or whoever you're using. And I think that's because writers make mistakes. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's a thing. But, and I'm not, I'm not perfect at it. And that's the thing too. Like I, it's what I try to do. I try to not underestimate my reader. Cause at the same time too, like I'm not like a rocket scientist. I'm not presenting them with theories that are like crazy hard. Like, you know, I'm not writing at like a, a crazy postgraduate level. Like, yeah, I think the average reader is pretty savvy. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Cause I'm, the, I'm, I'm just the average writer. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to create something that can't be understood. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, good answer. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again for all of you. We'll be here again next week at four thirty Newfoundland time or online at chmr.ca. Please tune in and we'll talk more about writing culture in Newfoundland.